Good afternoon, this is Joseph Donnelly from New Jersey Free Public Library, Health Services Librarian. And today we're going to talk to former CIA Director uh, John Brennan about his book, Undaunted. And he's a former resident of Hudson County, where he lived in North Bergen. How are you, Dr. Uh, John Brennan? Well, director. thank you so much, Joseph. And uh, I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk with you today. As you noted, I am a Hudson County native, quite proud of my Jersey roots. Uh, I still consider myself a New Jerseyite. And in fact, tell my children that they're really New Jerseyites. They just happen to be born in Virginia. Uh, they're not <laughs> buying it though. But uh, so when you uh, extended this very kind invitation to me, I jumped at the opportunity to have some interaction with uh, current uh, New Jerseyites and Jersey City uh, Public Library. You had a very interesting family history very colorful family, uh, Irish family, especially your grandfather, uh, Odie, who was raised and born in Ireland, and he was a member, a courier for the Irish Republican Army. What can you tell us about him? Well, I never met him. He was my uh, father's okay. father, and he mm -hmm. was uh, yes, born in County Roscommon, Ireland, which is in the center of the country. And my father grew up in Roscommon. And he stayed in Ireland until he was 28 years old before he emigrated to this country uh, back in 1948. Uh, but uh, my brother or sister and I would just love to hear stories about Ireland that my father would tell and about Odie Brennan and uh, what it was like to uh, live on a farm. Uh, and fortunately, uh, my siblings and I have been able to return to Ireland a number of times over the years. We're able to see where my father grew up and uh, and to see some of the sites that uh, were part of the stories of my youth. And your mother's family was uh, the Duns. They were a very interesting family as well, weren't they? Yeah. yeah, that term interesting can be applied to many different types of situations. Uh, yeah, my, my mother, uh, Dorothy Dunn, uh, comes from uh, families that came from Ireland as well. Uh, and so uh, the Hingstons uh, were my uh, mother's uh, mother's family name, Hingstons and Aherns and the Duns, they all arrived in Jersey City um, when they came to the States after a brief stop in, in New York as they processed through the immigration uh, procedures there uh, and then wound up in Jersey City and then ultimately migrated across the Jersey City Hoboken border to the Mile Square City. Uh, and so my grandparents uh, lived in Hoboken when my mother was born in 1921. Uh, and I spent a lot of days uh, when I was a youngster uh, visiting my grandparents. It was on 11th and Hudson Street in Hoboken. And my father wound up working, in fact, for Maxwell House Coffee uh, there for about 20 years. So yes, uh, my roots uh, go back to Hudson County, Jersey City, uh, Hoboken uh, with our family history. My grandfather, Thomas, who I talk about in the book was uh, in bootlegging with uh, his brother, Frankie. And Frankie Dunn was uh, famously or infamously uh, gunned down uh, in, uh, uh, during the Prohibition years um, in Hoboken uh, back in uh, uh, 1930 or so. And you always had a love uh, interest with history. And you, you talk about in your book, you like the American Civil War, American Revolution, all about the spies and everything. And that's what made you think about being uh, an agent. Yeah, well, unfortunately, in my youth, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have all of this, you know, tremendous amounts of information available at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. But my parents used to buy these uh, books at the grocery stores. They were serial encyclopedias and, and history books and other things, and which were replete with lots of photos about the revolution and civil war. And, and so I was really enamored uh, with this country's history, especially since my father told me uh, always to... Uh, to cherish my American citizenship uh, because this is a great and wonderful country. And uh, he aspired his first 28 years to come to this country and openly did. And so as a, as a youth, I was quite interested in learning more about it, which got me interested then in uh, exploring uh, opportunities later on in my life uh, to work for the U.S. government. And uh, you went to Fordham University to go to law school? That's correct. Well, I went to uh, St. Joseph's High School. Oh, uh, St. Joseph's. So we, we lived in West New York and then North Bergen. And so mm. I went to St. Joseph's, the Palisades Elementary School, and then high school, and then went to Fordham University in New York. Not the law school. It was the Rhodes Hill campus up in the Bronx, where I got my bachelor's degree. Uh, but while I was going to Fordham, I also had the opportunity to 
go overseas a couple of times, including uh, to Egypt, where I studied Arabic and Middle East studies at the American University in Cairo. Uh, and then after that, I went down to the University of Texas in Austin to get my uh, graduate degree in government. Very good. Uh, and But you saw that ad at, uh, down in the University of Austin about joining the CIA? Yeah, well, in fact, it was, I, was, uh, I used to commute back and forth to Fordham. I would take uh, the bus to Port Authority and then take a couple of trains uptown. And it was on one of those uh, bus rides that I was reading the New York Times and saw that the CIA was advertising for uh, individuals to apply to the organization. And uh, not knowing what I wanted to do after Fordham, I, I sent in a, a very limited resume that I had at the time. But... I did have some overseas experience. I, I had studied some Arabic. And so uh, I went over to New York City for an interview uh, with the CIA recruiter. He gave me an application. He told me if I was going to go to graduate school to fill out that application when I was nearing the completion of my graduate studies, which I did. And uh, then went to uh, Washington DC for a series of interviews and CIA hired me then back in 1980. And uh, did you go to the uh, farm? That's what they call that CIA for uh, courses and, th and oh. other programs at the farm? Too. Yeah, there's a, a major CIA training facility in the woodlands of Virginia uh, yeah. that's been uh, chronicled quite a bit in books as well as in films and is referred to as the farm. And that's a place where we train CIA officers in all different types of things, whether it be in espionage or analysis or operational activities and also uh, train in, in firearms and defensive driving. And so I went down to the farm a number of times throughout my career to qualify uh, for you know, weapons as well as for other types of things. But yeah, it's a, it's a great facility and it trains uh, generations of CIA officers. It has trained them over the years. And they signed you to the Near East Division of Directorate Operations as clear, that's right? Yes, because my, my academic concentration was in mid, the Middle East, and I had that experience living in Cairo, and I had Arabic, so I was assigned to that uh, division uh, in operations, but I quickly shifted out in the first year to work on analysis. I thought I was better suited for that and had a stronger interest in analysis than in operations. Uh, but uh, shortly after I joined the analytic side of CIA, I then went over to Saudi Arabia for two years. My, my first tour in Saudi Arabia from 1982 to 84. Uh, and before I went over there, I had intensive Arabic language training. So when I was living in Saudi Arabia in the early 80s with my wife, uh, my Arabic was pretty good and I got to travel throughout the kingdom. Uh, it was a fascinating, fascinating time in my life. There was a lot of things going on in the Middle East during the uh, 80s, like uh, the Iraq-Iran war, uh, the assassination of Sadat and the oil crisis, um, the Iran, the um, yeah, there was absolutely a lot of things as you point out, mm -hmm. uh, including terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. especially in Lebanon, in Beirut, where the U.S. embassy as well as the Marine barracks were bombed. In fact, when I was in Saudi Arabia uh, and I heard about the bombing in Beirut as I was reading the cables that were coming into the embassy about the fatalities. I noticed the name Robert Ames, and Robert Ames had been my boss at CIA headquarters before I went out to Saudi Arabia. And I was surprised to see that name because he was posted in Washington, DC, but he happened to be traveling to Beirut at that time of the bombing and uh, tragically was, was killed. Uh, he was only 49 years old and was about six months away from retirement. Uh, but uh, again, he was uh, very, very tragically killed in that attack. And you went back to Saudi Arabia from 1996 to 99 as the CIA station chief, as correct? Yes, well, in the early 80s, when my wife and I were out there, we didn't have children. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but then in the 90s and 96, when we went back to Saudi Arabia, uh, we had three children who were in elementary school. And it was an opportunity for our children to have the experience of living overseas and seeing what it's like to uh, live in another culture. So yeah, uh, Kathy, my wife, who really is the rock and the anchor uh, during my lifetime and has been tremendously supportive of my professional national security career, uh, agreed that we would go back to Saudi Arabia for another three years. Uh, and this was from 96 to 99. And it was a time when there was growing concern about Al Qaeda 
about Osama bin Laden. And I was working closely with the Saudis at the time to see if they would give us the information we needed in order to stop uh, future terrorist attacks. And uh, in, going back to when Iraq invaded Kuwait in August 2nd, 1990, your boss, Bob Leighton, asked you to brief George Bush as national security team. Yeah, I was, um, I was still a very junior officer at the time, and I had never been to the uh, Oval Office at the White House uh, previously, but this was in 1991. And uh, so I was asked to go down with another CIA officer uh, to brief uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush on what the implications would be on the terrorist front in the event the United States uh, marshaled a coalition of forces to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Iraq had invaded Kuwait uh, about a month or two before. And so George H.W. Bush, who was a former director of CIA and was very well, very knowledgeable about the events in the Middle East, I was rather intimidated going into the Oval Office to brief the President of the United States for the first time. And I remember saying to myself, what's a, a kid from Hudson County doing in the Oval Office briefing the most powerful person in the world? But George H.W. Bush, like a son, very nice, very personable and really put me at ease uh, early in that conversation. And so I was there for about 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, again, it was just a, a great opportunity to, to see the, uh, a president of the United States uh, take intelligence information uh, before making a very important decision about our country's national security. Um, you were assigned to counterterrorism, counterterrorism center known as the CTC to be the analyst chief of the team, what were your primary duties? Well, at the time, there was a lot of terrorist activity throughout the Middle East. As I mentioned, it was Hezbollah that carried out those attacks in Lebanon, but the Palestinian terrorism and terrorism in, in South America as well. And so my responsibility was to take the intelligence that was coming in to CIA headquarters and to be able to provide uh, analysis, assessments, and briefings to the president, the vice president, and other senior members of the national security team. I also did a fair amount of traveling at the time, briefing foreign officials, heads of state, prime ministers and others on the uh, prospect of Iraqi terrorism uh, once the United States uh, moved its military forces into the region to push Saddam out of Kuwait. So it was a, it was a real learning experience. I got a lot of uh, exposure uh, to the national security apparatus of the US government, but also did a lot of work overseas interacting with the US partners and allies around the globe. Um, and then later on, you became the Deputy Division Chief of the Arab Israel Division and served with Martha Kessler. Well, yeah, it was all part of my, uh, my progression within the CIA, just mm -hmm. going up. And that was the job I had before I then uh, became President Clinton's daily briefer at the White House, which was a, a good opportunity for me, again, to see a president on a daily basis. President Clinton, a very, very bright individual who had a photographic memory. Uh, and every morning I would go in, spend about you know 20 minutes or so or 30 minutes uh, with the president, Vice President Gore and others, uh, and just sharing the, the latest intelligence uh, information as well as analysis with them. Uh, so yeah, it was a great opportunity for me. And uh, George Tennant became CIA, CIA director. You became his uh, chief of staff? Yeah, well, he was one of the other people at the White House that I would brief. He was the head of the intelligence programs at the National Security Council. And when he was nominated to be the deputy director of Central Intelligence Agency, he asked me to work with him through his confirmation process. And then I became his executive assistant when he wound up at, at CIA headquarters. And then, oh yeah, you became the director of the Terrorist Threat Integration Center from 2003 to 2004. Yeah, well, I had bounced around after going to Saudi Arabia the second time. I served as George Tennant's chief of staff then, and then I was, in the aftermath of 9-11, George W. Bush uh, asked me to stand up something called the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, which then became the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, and this was our effort to try to ensure that information that the FBI and CIA and NSA and other parts of the national security environment were sharing information. And so it was a great opportunity for me to uh, be in charge of a startup within the government uh, 
so I did that for several years before I retired from CIA uh, in 2005, my first retirement from CIA. Um, the CIA was very busy during the war against terrorism since 9-11, you, uh, Operation Born Freedom for uh, liberation of Afghanistan from Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and the invasion of Iraq. So you were, I was very busy tracking down terrorists in Al-Qaeda and Taliban and Osama bin Laden. Yeah, the CIA is frequently called the 911 organization because if something goes wrong anywhere around the world that affects U.S. interests, the CIA has a role to play. Either it's going out there and collecting intelligence or engaging in different types of covert action activities that the president may authorize, as well as doing the analysis and other types of things. So, yeah, the, uh, the CIA always has a lot on its plate, and uh, certainly in the aftermath of 9-11, there was so much to be done, and I was just privileged to be a part of it. Um, was it uh, the capture and, and the search for Osama bin Laden was very difficult, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. In fact, I was on the phone this morning with uh, some reporters because there's going to be a lot of reporting done in a couple of weeks uh, because it'll be the 10th anniversary of the operation that killed bin Laden, which was on May 1st of 2011. And uh, I was working in the White House at the time. I had come back into government after Barack Obama was elected president. I was his uh, Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor. And so it was a real, real important time uh, as we uh, learned about uh, the possible whereabouts of bin Laden. We didn't have confirmation that he was at that compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. But President Obama wanted to make sure that the victims of 9-11 and their families we're able to see justice um, and to make sure that if we had the opportunity to get bin Laden, we would. So President Obama authorized that raid and thankfully it was successful. And uh, none of the uh, US special forces who courageously and very capably carried out that, that raid uh, by helicopters, they all were able to um, conduct the raid, kill bin Laden and then return safely to Afghanistan. Um. When you retired in your first time from the CIA, what did you do during your retirement? I learned what it was like to try to earn a living outside the appropriations of Congress, which was a, an eye-opening experience for me. And so uh, I, I worked in the private sector business for a few years. I served as president CEO of a small company that provided some support to the intelligence and law enforcement communities of the government uh, and although it was a good learning experience for me, it, it wasn't as uh, rewarding or as stimulating as my government career. So when Barack Obama very, very graciously invited me to, to join him uh, when he uh, arrived in, in Washington, D.C. in January of 2009, I, I jumped at the opportunity to get back into government. Good. Um, they, uh, when they called you the first time and said, oh, we want you to be the CIA director. And then a call, there was a call back later saying, uh, there's been a lot of problems asking you to be a, the CIA director because you don't think, they didn't think you passed the nomination because yeah. of all the uh, controversy back then during the CIA with waterboarding and weapons of mass destruction and other things, that kind of name. Yeah, I recount in my memoir that uh, President Obama asked me to be his first CIA director. And as what is done traditionally is that whenever a nomination is going to go forward, they, they float what's called a trial balloon in the press to see if anybody's going to try to shoot it down. Well, when they floated my name, sure enough, the guns came out and started to shoot my balloon down because uh, when I was at CIA, although I wasn't involved at all in the detention interrogation program, wasn't in the chain of command or didn't participate in any of that, I was at CIA at the time. And so there were a number of uh, CIA critics uh, that um, got very upset at the thought that Barack Obama would have somebody who served in the CIA at the time as his new CIA director. So uh, they pulled back that uh, potential nomination. But again, President Obama was nice enough to invite me to join him at the White House. Um, and so for four plus years of the Obama administration, uh, my office was directly below his in the West Wing, uh, so it took me about 15 seconds or so to get from my desk up to the Oval Office. And during those four years, I got to know Barack Obama 
much better than I would have known him had I been out in Langley, which is the CIA headquarters in Virginia across the Potomac River. Uh, so uh, it was a great opportunity for me and uh, it worked out well. Uh, Leon Panetta then was asked to be CIA director and I worked very closely with Leon. And then uh, during Obama's second term, uh, he asked me to uh, become CIA director. And although I still had some critics out there, uh, I was uh, confirmed by the Senate and became CIA director in March of, of 2013. And I stayed as CIA director until the end of Obama's administration in January of 2017. Uh, during, during his first administration, uh, Obama's administration, what was that like in the situation room when the helicopters were coming into Islamabad to uh, capture um, Osama bin Laden? Bin Laden? Yeah, well, uh, it was a very intense period in the in the months and weeks and days that led up to that raid, and we had to uh, look at all the intelligence and we had to look at the different options uh, to carry out a raid against that compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. President Obama decided that it would be a helicopter assault, and so we gathered in that White House Situation Room for many, many days. Um, and on the morning of that raid, again, we gathered together. And then there's the iconic photo of President Obama and Hillary Clinton and Vice President Biden and others, and I'm in that photo, uh, looking at uh, a wall, um, a screen, uh, as we are um, observing uh, some details about that raid. And it was a very tense period of time. We didn't know if that was indeed Ob uh, Osama bin Laden at the compound. At the compound, We were worried about the helicopter flights in and out of Pakistan from Afghanistan. Uh, thankfully, it all turned out very successfully, and I, I give President Obama a lot of credit because uh, it, there was no uh, confirmation that the person that we uh, believe was living at that compound was indeed uh, bin Laden. Very good. Um, what were some of the challenges in the second administration when you finally became CIA director, and what did the uh, CIA face? Uh, the well, there were, there were a, a lot of things uh, that were, were going on at the time. Um, I had to deal a lot with Congress. Uh, the Congress uh, was involved in reviews of CIA programs. The Senate Intelligence Committee was doing its a study on the detention interrogation program, and I got into some battles with some of the folks uh, in that committee. Uh, I felt that uh, some of it was very partisan and not very objective. Uh, it's ironic that uh, I was the CIA director in a Democratic administration, but uh, the members of Congress who are calling for my head or resignation or firing were mostly from the Democratic side of the, of the aisle. Uh, I'm not a Democrat or Republican. I try to be as, as outspoken and forthright as I can be, which has got me in hot water over the years. But that's fine because my, my father and mother instilled in me a very strong sense of making sure that I did what was right and my, uh, my moral North Star uh, and, and ethical compass, which I think the Franciscan sisters and Christian brothers of St. Joseph's in Hudson County instilled in me. Uh, and so while I was at CIA, I had to deal with a lot of the political winds that blow in, in Washington, uh, navigating between the, the partisan agendas of both the Republicans and the Democrats. But there were also a lot of challenges with Russia, uh, challenges with the uh, situation in Syria and Yemen, uh, the tremendous bloodshed and destruction and carnage uh, in many countries of the world, and you know, trying to ensure that CIA plays its role in supporting the president and national security officials. But then, as you well know, in 2016, as we were getting ready for the presidential election, the Russians decided to become involved in that election. And so that last year was a very busy year as we were trying to uncover Russian intelligence activities and try to stop uh, their interference in uh, the, the foundation stone of our democracy, which is the right of the American people to choose their, their president and elected leaders. So it was a, it was a busy four years. Uh, I also uh, restructured the CIA, uh, overhauled its organizational structure I wanted to make sure that I was able to deal with the future problems and not the past. Uh, I put a real emphasis on uh, cyber and digital innovation and making sure that CIA understood uh, the complexities of that uh, very, very uh, ubiquitous uh, digital environment. 
you also monitor um, and probably had a role in it of global pandemics and epidemics as well, like <laughs> Ebola and um, um, uh, the swine flu and a few others that were happening during yeah, Obama's time. Obama's first term when I was his Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, I, I was very familiar with counterterrorism. I didn't realize all the things that were included in the Homeland Security portfolio, <laughs> earthquakes, floods, uh, hurricanes, uh, all different types of things, cyber uh, threats, uh, but also pandemics. And so uh, in April of 2009, in the first few months of the Obama administration, we were confronted with what is referred to, as you said, swine flu, it was H1N1. It was a pandemic. It wasn't as virulent and as contagious as uh, the COVID-19 challenge that we're facing now. But there was a, a lot of concern because it was around the globe. And fortunately, uh, we had some tremendous, tremendous medical experts, and scientists. Uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, I worked very closely with him. He is a national treasure. And so thankfully, we were able to do some things to mitigate the effects of the H1N1 pandemic. Uh, there were a, num a significant number of people uh, who, who died as a result, uh, mainly those who were vulnerable because of some other medical conditions. But it really introduced me to that medical scientific health world. Uh, again, so it was a, a tremendous learning experience for me since I was uh, the president's Homeland Security Advisor and had to update him on what we were doing to try to address uh, H1N1. I was at CIA during the Ebola crisis. And so CIA used its uh, worldwide capabilities uh, and presence in Africa uh, to uh, report on uh, the Ebola uh, crisis and what the governments there were doing about it and how we could contain its spread. The uh, ISIS came into the picture during your uh, administration, right? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, um, is the is the product of the merger of Al Qaeda in Iraq and Al Qaeda in Syria, and uh, in the 2013-2014 timeframe, those organizations, those two countries, came together, and they took advantage of the opportunities presented in Iraq, as uh, the government was was basically very frail and fragile, and also the Arab Spring that was. Uh, spreading throughout the Middle East and particularly in Syria. And so ISIS then took over large swaths of territory in Iraq and Syria, and also carried out uh, attacks in, in Europe. Uh, it was a, a technically sophisticated organization. A lot of individuals who joined ISIS came from Europe and they had technical and cyber proficiency and they were able to communicate with each other secretively and also um, find information out uh, on that World Wide Web that they use to carry out attacks. Thankfully, uh, at the end of the Obama administration and then into the Trump administration, there was a coalition of military forces and intelligence and security services that uh, worked against ISIS. And ISIS now is just a, a very uh, a mere shadow of what it once was, but it's still a threat. It still exists in different parts of Syria and Iraq just the way Al Qaeda does. So it's one of these threats that uh, continues despite the very good and, and successful work done against it. Um, when the November 2016 election came, were you surprised of the outcome? <laughs> yes, I was. Um, just the way all the polls were predicting that Hillary Clinton was going to win. I. I didn't think that Donald Trump would prevail. Um, I was very worried about how the Russians were helping him. And I knew that, or at the time, I didn't believe that the Russians were going to be able to manipulate the vote tallies because uh, even though we saw they were navigating into some of the electoral in infrastructure, uh, I didn't believe that they had the ability to really change the, the, the number of votes uh, that were going to be counted up. I was very concerned about the information operations, uh, their social media presence, the way they were influencing American voters, how they were shaping views and attitudes. Uh, but I, I still thought that uh, most Americans, um, uh, and indeed uh, there were more votes cast for Hillary Clinton than for Donald Trump, but I thought the Electoral College uh, was going to result in a victory for Hillary Clinton. I thought 
uh, Americans, more Americans uh, would have been able to see through Donald Trump's dishonesty, um, deceit, uh, and uh, the, the yarns that he was spinning. Um, unfortunately, he is a masterful spokesperson and he was appealing to a lot of the, the grievances and legitimate concerns of American people. But uh, he, he is sort of the modern day equivalent of a, a snake oil salesman. And I, I, I didn't think as many Americans would cast their vote for somebody who, at least from my perception, uh, was uh, just a blatantly dishonest uh, and demagogue who uh, cared less about uh, the people of the United States than he did about his own fortunes. Not that I feel strongly about the issue, but I do. <laughs> now, the, the end of 2016 into early 2017 was very rough because Trump was becoming president. You had to go brief him during the transition. Your dad was not doing well. He was in his late 90s. And uh, so you had a lot on your plate. Yes, my, my father's uh, condition, um, medical condition, started to deteriorate in uh, late 2016. Uh, he was over 96 and a half years old, but still a very strong man. Uh, but uh, throughout uh, December in particular, uh, he started to deteriorate. And so I spent a lot of time going back and forth to New Jersey. Thankfully, my, my brother and sister uh, were there uh, regularly and, and taking care of my father and my mother. Um, but in late December, my father passed away. And this was while we were still dealing with uh, the aftermath of the election and Russian interference. And so the intelligence assessment that we had pulled together, it was at this time, um, I, I tried to devote my full attention to my family when I was with them, but then also to my intelligence responsibilities when I, I needed to. And then in early January, uh, myself and Jim Comey, the director of FBI, and Jim Clapper, the director of national intelligence, Mike Rogers, the director of NSA, we went to Trump Tower in New York City to brief Donald Trump and his, his uh, colleagues on the uh, assessment of Russian interference in the presidential election. It was a, a memorable event for me. Uh, Donald Trump was much different than any of the president, six presidents that I worked for. Uh, I, I didn't find him curious about the facts and the truth. I found him more curious about what is it that we knew and how he could continue to blame China or others uh, and uh, discredit the assessment that the Russians were helping him in the election. Uh, so it, it was uh, about two weeks after that that he was inaugurated as president. Uh, I left my post on January 20th at, at noon uh, when Donald Trump was inaugurated, so I never worked for him, thankfully. Uh, and then in the subsequent uh, years, uh, Donald Trump and I got into a bit of a, a back and forth, <laughs> if you will, because uh, we had differences of view about uh, his um, capabilities uh, and uh, integrity. You got into a Twitter war with him. That's that's what I that's what I read in the book. Well, we had yes, we were exchanging some, some Twitter some tweets uh, on on Twitter, and uh, I just felt that that he was um, inundated in that Twitter sphere with again lies, deceit, dishonesty, and uh, I hadn't been in Twitter before, but I I felt an obligation, especially to my former colleagues, because he was so disparaging and denigrating of the tremendous work and sacrifices of my former colleagues at CIA and the rest of the intelligence community and FBI and other places that I was outraged at what he was doing and saying. Uh, and so I decided that I was going to swing back and uh, maybe my Jersey came out. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm allowed to say that in these, you know, these days, but uh, I, I became quite angered and irate uh, and tried to um, you know, set the record straight, um, at least from my uh, perspective. Uh, and although Donald Trump uh, claimed that he was revoking my security clearances, the White House made a big announcement in the summer of 2018, uh, claiming that because of my recklessness, they were withdrawing my security clearances. They never did because there was no basis to do that. Mm -hmm. The reason why former directors retain their security clearances is so that if the 
the future CI directors or others wanted to talk to them about some things that maybe occurred during their tenure, it'd be very easy to do that and talk about classify things. I would call back some of my predecessors to ask them about, well, what was it that led us to do this? Or what is the impression of the, the head of this country or this intelligence service? Uh, but although they didn't revoke my clearances in the Trump administration, they did prohibit CIA from allowing me to look at any of my classified files when I put together my memoir. Uh, so I was prevented from, from doing that. Uh, so I had to rely on my recollection and memory, which fortunately I think is pretty good, as well as some discussions I had with my former colleagues. Um, now, which, when the pandemic hit, what was your reaction to all this? Uh, well, first of all, I was so, so glad that Tony Fauci and some of the others that I had worked with were still there. Um, and I think early on, it was quite obvious that Donald Trump once again was trying to deceive the American public, uh, continually downplaying this and not allowing the medical and health uh, experts really take the lead. It's one of the things that I really appreciated and admired about President Obama. When I briefed him about the H1N1 uh, pandemic, I remember the first conversation I had with him, he said, well, we want the doctors and the scientists to really take the lead in making sure that we understand the implications of this pandemic. Uh, he never told us to try to downplay or to try to misrepresent the facts. Uh, President Obama always wanted us to be as open and transparent with the American public. Donald Trump, uh, I think throughout his, his life has always tried to spin things so that uh, he looks uh, good and uh, he does not want the facts to drive the public narrative. And so I, I do think that the early days of the COVID pandemic uh, were a lost opportunity to try to get ahead of this issue and to really warn the American public about just how virulent and uh, lethal this pandemic was going to be. Uh, I do have my uh, serious doubts about the, the Chinese and whether or not you know, we still know the story about uh, how this um, pandemic you know, started initiated. I think the Chinese were holding back as well. But uh, a president of the United States, it really has the biggest uh, bullhorn <laughs> globally. And the words of a president of the United States matter. And Donald Trump would have put the country's, indeed the world's interests above his own personal political interests. But he just, as he's done throughout his, his lifetime, or refused to do that. And so I think we, we lost uh, some very important time to deal with this pandemic uh, more effectively than we have. Um, now, uh the 2020, uh, when we had the election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and when Joe Biden was elected, how what was your how did you feel about that? Great relief. Yes, me too. Uh, I didn't have to pursue any you know thoughts about you know moving overseas. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I I know and admire Joe Biden. Uh, he he used to call my parents on their on their birthdays. Uh, he uh, visited uh, with my, my, my father and my brother at, in Hoboken. Uh, and so there's a real strong connection there. Uh, he's just a genuinely good person who really wants to do everything he can, for the American people, as well as for his you know, fellow global citizens. So I, I, I also knew that Joe Biden was going to bring together a, a very good group of competent, capable uh, individuals with the highest integrity, which is what we need in the government. So uh, I, was, I was very pleased. I wasn't surprised at all that Donald Trump kicked and screamed and cried uh, when he lost the uh, electoral college vote and he'd lost the popular vote by what, six, eight million votes. Uh, and I clearly see Donald Trump as being primarily responsible for the assault on our nation's capital on January 6th. I think it was, outrageous what he did. More outrageous though, is uh, what the some members of Congress, uh, those sycophantic, unfortunately, uh, Republican members of the Senate and the House, uh, how they continue to justify, rationalize and support uh, these things that Donald Trump was doing 
uh, which was basically a trampling of our democratic system processes and uh, you know, what has really been the, the practice of our government for 240 some odd years. Wow. Um, la um, my last question, uh, your deputy director of the CIA, Avril Haynes, became the director of national intelligence. You must have felt great joy and pride about that. Absolutely. I, I was very fortunate at CIA to have three outstanding deputies. Michael Morell, who was a CIA professional who I'd worked with for decades, was my first deputy. Then Avril Haynes, who I worked with in the White House very closely. Avril is one of the brightest, most competent, hardest working individuals I have ever met. And also probably one of the nicest people I've met as well. Uh, she is just a tremendous, tremendous asset uh, to this country. And so I, I couldn't be more pleased that she is now the current director of national intelligence. The director of CIA, Bill Burns, uh, was a colleague of mine. Uh, he worked at the State Department while I was working at CIA. Our, our paths had crossed numerous times. We worked very closely together. So he's a good friend and colleague. And I'm, I feel very good about uh, Bill being at the CIA and Bill's deputy. David Cohen was my third deputy at CIA, also somebody who is just a tremendously, tremendously talented individual. So I feel good that our intelligence uh, agencies are uh, under the helm of, under the direction and leadership of individuals who have the best interests of their fellow citizens at heart. Um, very good. Um, anybody have any questions? Now is, now is question time. Uh, you can raise your hand. Oh, okay. My aunt Claire Hamilton has a question for you. Okay. I was turning off my mute, but I do have a question. <laughs> um, I just wanted your opinion. First of all, thank you, because it's it's been a pleasure listening to you. And um, I look forward to uh, reading your book. I have to admit, I haven't read it yet, but I look forward to it, uh, especially now. And um, I too am from Jersey City in Hudson County. And unfortunately, right now, I live in Ohio. And I say I'm fortunate because of some of the legislators that have been acting up lately. But um, my question is, um, I was greatly relieved this January 20th, past January, uh, when um, Joe Biden was inaugurated. But I still feel like I have to sleep with one eye open because I worry about the momentum that still continues around Donald Trump. Should I be that worried? <laughs> well, I think as yeah. American citizens, we should be worried about a lot of things in this country. Um, from things as big and strategic as, as climate change, uh, as yeah. uh, cyber security threats, uh, to social injustice, to racism, to the growth of white supremacist movements and militias and other things. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Donald Trump and individuals of his ilk, as you point out, there are just so many individuals who have jumped onto his bandwagon because of his, quite frankly, his power and influence in terms of fundraising and, and Republican Party politics. I think they, they still are determined to do what they can to advance their um, image of what they believe the United States should be. And that's why when I see some of these lawmakers like this Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor Greene um, and yeah. others uh, who are just blatant racists, quite frankly, yeah. and uh, continue to uh, use dishonesty to try to win support. Now, there are some very legitimate grievances that Americans have, and particularly uh, a lot of those who were voting for Trump. Um, and that's why I think it is so, so appalling that he's taken advantage of people's situation. You know, if you lived in the Midwest, I mean, you lived in the Midwest and the factories that uh, uh, employed your grandparents and your parents and other family members, if it closed down because uh, the, the manufacturing now has been outsourced to other countries, and if the towns that you relied on are now becoming ghost towns, if you feel as though this globalized world has left you behind, then I can see why you are resentful of what you believe are sort of Washington politics, because they believe that Washington is not taking their interests into account. So I, I do think that, that uh, our lawmakers, our officials, and elected representatives need to be more honest with people. Unfortunately, I think Donald Trump was presenting a lot of these problems in simplistic ways. 
and providing simple-minded solutions to very, very complex problems. Yeah. The issue of income and wealth um, inequality in this country, social injustice, other things, these are really things that, that eat at the, the fabric of our, of our country and our, and our society. Um, and so we're becoming more and more polarized as a country, the, you know, the left and the right. And I think Joe Biden, who is a, a moderate, who is a centrist, mm -hmm. recognizes that there are issues that need to be addressed. Uh, and this polarization in the country is just leading our government to be more and more dysfunctional. So I, I do think we have to be concerned about the, some of these trends in, in the country. And again, I just I am so, so disappointed in particularly members of Republicans in the Senate who know better, but still misrepresent the facts because they have these partisan political ambitions uh, at the fore. Thank you. I think your brother Tom has a question. Hello? Anybody else? <laughs> Tom, can we hear you? No, we cannot. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, you can raise your hand or you can put something in the chat. Or, uh, it's um, unfortunate that I haven't been able to travel back to New Jersey over the last uh, 13 months or so because of uh, COVID. I'm very much looking forward to my, my return there. Uh, Thankfully, I still have family members and friends, high school classmates who keep me apprised of developments in, in New Jersey. Uh, but I guess like Claire, who is in Ohio, uh, being in Virginia, uh, I still go through Jersey withdrawal. <laughs> and uh, uh, when I do, I need to put a Springsteen record on or something to bring me back. <laughs> oh, uh, my Aunt Kate has a question. I'll um, um, you her. Okay. Hey, can we hear you? Yes, yes. And thanks again uh, for this, this program. It's been so interesting. Um, just big high level 360 view. What do you think is kind of the highest, uh, the biggest terrorist threat to our homeland security right now? Well, uh, um, I do think the uh, far right, uh, the white supremacists um, present the most serious threat because it's it's an insidious threat. It's within our midst already. Uh, you know, as as challenging as the Al Qaeda threat was to contain, um, we really did take great measures to um, guard against the entry of these Al Qaeda operatives from overseas. Now, some Al Qaeda elements were recruited uh, domestically here, but um, this far right, these white supremacists, these racist groups, these militias um, are here and they are here in you know, significant numbers, I think as was shown uh, in the assault on the Capitol. They have tremendous access to weaponry. There are individuals who um, are determined to try to advance uh, their interests. Uh, and this is where uh, the FBI and I think Director Ray recently said that it is the most challenging of those terrorist uh, threats right now. That doesn't mean that we should ignore the threats that are coming from different parts of the world. Uh, those terrorist organizations that purport to be Islamic or uh, others. Uh, but I, I, I do see that uh, what is here in this country already and the determination that some of these groups have to pursue their agendas. Um, in some respects, the January 6th assault was a good wake up call and it has allowed the authorities at the federal, state and local levels to identify individuals um, in these groups who are uh, involved in these extremist activities. And I'm hoping that there is going to be some very uh, positive developments from the standpoint of being able to uh, roll back some of those threats. Some of these uh, groups uh, have contacts with uh, groups abroad, neo-Nazi organizations and far-right organizations in Europe. Uh, they are in communication and contact with some of these domestic US extremist groups. So I, again, I think that that is uh, the most uh, serious concern. And it's a concern that 
quite frankly, I think we see throughout this country uh, because there is there are these elements, um, you know, from the East Coast to the West Coast. Thank you very much. I think Ann Malinowski has a question. Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Brennan. Uh, Mr. Brennan, you spoke so eloquently about the important things that the important lessons that you learned from your parents. Could you speak to the skill sets, the same skill sets that were needed to be director of the CIA and those same sets, skill sets that are necessary to be the owner and manager of the Hudson Tavern in Hoboken? <laughs> yeah, well, I think the, uh, there have been many, many times I think that managing or running the CIA was a lot easier than, than running a, a tavern and restaurant. But some of those, I think the skills are the same. You need to be able to um, lead a staff uh, with integrity, uh, competence. Um, one of the things that I really applaud are those those restaurants that uh, take seriously their obligation on the COVID-19. If their staff test positive, that they need to be able to close down, they need to notify their, their clients. If there are rules regarding the number of individuals that are allowed to go into those dining establishments and that there are certain hours that they need to uh, you know, close, uh, they need to abide by those rules. Same thing in CIA, there, is, there are rules that the CIA has to abide by and they, they must do that. Um, and uh, although a lot of people think that the CIA is a rogue organization, uh, the CIA carries out its responsibilities uh, under uh, statutory authorities uh, at the president's direction, uh, but also just the way a restaurant or a tavern has to serve clients, uh, the CIA has to serve clients as well. Uh, the policymakers in the executive branch, the members of Congress, uh, and as you can imagine, uh, just like in a restaurant where sometimes you have clients who don't like uh, the dishes that they are served, uh, there are a lot of folks <laughs> in the uh, Congress and even the executive branch that don't like the intelligence that's provided to them because sometimes that intelligence is contrary to what their uh, views are or policy druthers might be. So uh, I'd like to think that uh, my, my brother and I, uh, you know, maybe have some shared experiences and as a result of the, the, the examples set by our parents uh, that uh, trying to do what is right uh, and trying to do um, what is the honest thing to do, whether or not you're running a, a, a business establishment or you're running a, a large organization at the federal government, uh, there are certain uh, ethics, certain uh, rules, certain morals uh, that apply. Uh, so uh, I do think both of them have their, their, their challenges. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Raise a hand or put something in the chat. Um, that's a question again. Hey. That, thanks again for taking uh, another question. It, it just occurred to me that uh, when you were talking about how when you were at Fordham University, um, you were studying Middle Eastern history, um, which is also, also something that's always fascinated me. But I'm wondering if there was something in your childhood or high school education that sparked an interest in Middle Eastern cultures or just world cultures in general? A book, a teacher, yeah, something? Yeah, a teacher. In, 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 my, um, in my memoir, I talk about the, um, the influence that my cousin Tom had on uh, me. Hey, um, thank it, you, thank you. <laughs> I think that's Tom Brennan, my cousin, who's on there and who has not muted his microphone. And that's why we have some garbles in the back there. So if you could mute that comment to speak, thank you. Uh, but but Tom um, was my um, first cousin. Uh, his father and my father were brothers. And uh, Tom served in the Peace Corps uh, when I was in elementary school. Tom went to St. Peter's College in Jersey City. 
both he and his brother Jim, as did my sister. Uh, but then Tom went into the Peace Corps and served in Malaysia. And so he would write letters home and he would send um, uh, audio recordings home about what it was like to be in these impoverished villages and really just emphasize the importance uh, and then just how special it was for uh, Americans uh, to have all of the tremendous good fortune that we had in our country. And so he was able to, I think, uh, while I was at a very young age, just be able to describe uh, the life in another part of the world, which I think instilled that wanderlust in me. And so it, it led me to read up about Malaysia. Uh, he then served with the, the Agency for International Development, AID, uh, in Vietnam. And then again, as I recount in my book, he uh, was the food for peace officer at the American embassy in Jakarta, Indonesia uh, in 1974, the summer of my freshman year in college. And I decided to, when, when he invited me uh, and uh, to go over to Indonesia for the summer months. And um, I did a, a paper for Fordham so I could get some credit for it. But I spent about two and a half months over there uh, going across Java, the island of Java, went to Bali. Uh, road motorcycle in Java and Bali. Uh, and it, it really did then stimulate my interest in learning as much about the world as possible. So that when I returned to Fordham in my sophomore year uh, and I was commuting back and forth, that got old. And so when one of my college professors uh, brought in a brochure for the American University in Cairo uh, during my, for my junior year study abroad program, uh, I jumped at that opportunity. Up until that point, I really had no real uh, awareness uh, more than just you know reading in the newspaper about what was going on in the Middle East. But uh, once I went over to Cairo, uh, Cairo is a, just a wonderful, fascinating city. This was in 1975. And so uh, during my time in Cairo, I also then traveled uh, to Jerusalem, I spent Christmas Eve in Bethlehem, uh, went uh, into Israel, uh, went on a kibbutz for a while, uh, just traveled in Jordan and other areas. And again, it just really prompted me to be fascinated by the history and the culture and the people and the language of the Middle East. Uh, so when I returned to Fordham and graduated, that's when I went down to the University of Texas because they had a very good Middle East studies program there at the time. Uh, so when I was pursuing my master's, I concentrated on the Middle East and, you know, it's the Middle East is the cradle of civilization. I hope it's not going to be <laughs> uh, the end of it as well. Uh, that's why I think it's so important for us to continue to pay attention to what's going on in that part of the world. It affects U.S. national security interests uh, significantly uh, in, in the globalized world. Uh, what happens uh, in different parts of the globe, uh, more than any other country, I think the United States needs to pay attention to it as well as uh, do what we can to try to uh, reduce the prospects for even greater bloodshed, instability, and uh, civil war. Very well. Thank you. And just one last ask, could you give us maybe a favorite phrase in Arabic? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the ones that are suitable for a... <laughs> <laughs> For an audience such as this, you mean? Not necessarily. <laughs> it's a rough crowd. Hudson County. <laughs> well, you know, what you'll hear a lot is salamu alaikum, which is peace unto you. And the response is, wa alaikum wa salam, and peace be back to you. But the uh, other thing, sabah khair is uh, good morning. Sabah nur is the response to that. And so I just found that. Uh, Again, I studied and forgot Arabic many times over the years, but it, it really was a way to get to know uh, people throughout the Middle East. Uh, when I was in Egypt and just learning Arabic, I would, I would use my rudimentary Arabic with my uh, taxi cab drivers or, or others. And um, throughout the course of my, my study, uh, my pronunciation is pretty good in Arabic, uh, but uh, you know, vocabulary, you lose it uh, over time. Uh, and unfortunately, whenever I start to speak Arabic with, you know, some folks these days, they think that I am a native uh, Arabic speaker <laughs> and I get, quickly get lost. But uh, I, I do go back into my, my textbooks, my Arabic uh, language books uh, occasionally just to try to refresh my memory on things. Uh, but uh, there, there, there's a lot of things and phrases that are very important. Um, 
people claim that, you know, I converted when I was in Saudi Arabia. No, you know, I, I didn't. I guess I'm a practicing agnostic these days. Uh, but uh, obviously within the Arabic language, uh, there is so much that is anchored in Islam and uh, from the Quran. And so uh, one of the things that uh, Muslims will say is la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah, which is there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, so uh, there are many, many phrases and uh, I think that uh, bring back uh, memories to me. And once in a while, I'll flip on an Arabic language uh, TV channel uh, just so I can reacquaint my ear uh, with the, uh, the beauty of, of Arabic. It's a very logical language in many respects. Uh, but again, if, if, it's, if you don't practice it on an ongoing basis, uh, you tend to, to lose it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, former CIA director, uh, director Woolsey uh, mentioned sometime last week or the week before about UFOs. Do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I've been asked that question uh, also, and there are some things that on, on Twitter that reference some of my comments. Um, you know, I've been asked many times about UFOs and, and life beyond Earth. When I was at CIA, in one of my many jobs that I had over the course of, of the years, uh, I had the, the UFO sighting portfolio as one of my accounts when I had a, you know, a larger account. Um, and so we would try to, um, to uh, keep track of those reported sightings. Uh, a lot of times they'd be explained away by different types of um, atmospheric uh, occurrences and developments and uh, different types of light that was, you know, uh, intersecting with some things. Uh, but one of the things I've also said is that when I think about just how large our universe is, um, and as we're, we're finding things out about Mars and maybe what was there millions of years ago, if there was any type of, of moisture or water or organism, uh, I think it's, when we refer to life, I'm not talking about you know human beings in terms of life, just life of all different sorts, even just cell life. Uh, I think it's it's pretty arrogant of us to think that the only place in this universe where there's any form of life uh, that is only on in Earth, I, I think that to me it defies. Uh, logic, I guess. So uh, probably there's somewhere in this big universe of ours where there's some form of, of life. <laughs> Certainly doesn't look like you or me, Joe. Uh, and, and it might not be, you know, what we, what we define currently as intelligent life, but uh, we are just still exploring the outer reaches <laughs> of the universe and what might be on those various planetary objects that are out there. And, um, you know, who knows what um, will be the prevailing wisdom in 200 or 300 years from now about um, the existence of life uh, in, the, in the universe. Um, uh, should we worry about what happened, what was going on in Jordan this past two weeks? I mean, since there are um, uh, cousins in intelligence and they always seem to back us all the time. Well, yeah, the Jordanian monarchy is a very important monarchy from the standpoint of trying to keep that, that country, that government stable. King Abdullah, um, who I think is really trying to keep things together there. Uh, Jordan is a, is a very uh, poor country. Um, it has real, no, no real natural resources. It relies on the, the subventions and, and uh, generosity of uh, other Arab states and, and the international community. Um, he sits on top of a country that is more than 50% Palestinian. Uh, Native Jordanians who are referred to as East Bankers uh, make up less than half of that population. He, Jordan is right next to the West Bank and, and Israel. Uh, he, Jordan has also been the country where there have been hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of refugees that have fled Syria and have just inundated Jordanian uh, towns and, and uh, the countryside 
uh, which has put quite a bit of a burden on the government of Jordan to provide, you know, health and sanitation, educational and employment opportunities or whatever. So um, the, uh, the recent arrests of a number of individuals who reportedly were plotting against King Abdullah, uh, that, is, uh, that was worrisome. It appears as though it's now back, uh, you know, in a more stable uh, setting. Uh, so I, I just hope that that monarchy and King Abdullah continues to, you know, um, be a, a stable country because it, it uh, occupies a very important uh, strategic uh, part of uh, the Middle East. Well, Joe, I'm going to have to uh, sign off in a, in a okay. moment too because I have some, a few other things this afternoon, but I just wanted to express my appreciation to you and to the Jersey City Public Library as well as to the folks on this. It's always great to be able to talk with either current New Jerseyites or uh, former New Jerseyites who, like me, you know, think about New Jersey regularly. But uh, I also appreciate, Joseph, your obviously your close reading of my, my memoir and the questions that you raised and the other questions that came out today. So uh, I wish you well. And uh, again, want to thank you for you know, your graciousness and uh, hospitality today. We wish you well as well. And I want you to thank uh, Nick Shapiro for me for, for setting this up. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you so much. Okay, everybody have a nice day. Thank you, John. Take Brett. care. And thank talk you. Bye-bye.